listening. Yes, I already know yeah. to know some of you students also have interacted with him, and he is the student, our very own alumni of the very first batch of uh, computer science and engineering BPP IMT. Uh, I have a brief introduction, so Sasi sir has shared with me. So uh, instead of going uh, line by line, I'll just say that presently Otunu is uh, an IoT evangelist. That is his domain, his area, and he is the founder of Capsule Labs, his latest venture. Uh, but uh, before that, he has been the techno functional consultant for several IoT and AI-led digital transformations. Uh, in Altux, uh, he was the global sales team. He was in the global sales team, and before that, he was a member of the technical staff at Infosys. Set labs. He was in the Harvard Sensor Networking Lab in Telecordia Advanced Technology uh, Solutions Lab, which is now Ericsson. Uh, it happens to be Ericsson now and Blue Highway. So he has a huge amount of industry experience. Not to mention that he had been a postgraduate student in IIT Guwahati as well as Harvard University. And uh, so you can see that the three outcomes, three directions that any student can take, that is industry, academics and uh, entrepreneurship uh, actually Otunu has dabbed himself in all of these he is also the senior member of ieee and computer society of india published over 35 papers and have patents in the area of iot wireless sensor networks and he is constantly providing consultations for over 100 iot based solutions globally apart from this he still finds time for us and he comes back to his alma mater and uh, interacts with you all. Some of you have interacted with him. So without much further ado, I would like to, uh, I am really happy to see Professor Chatterjee, who is once again extremely dynamic. And he happens to be here again to welcome Otonu. So over to you, sir, please. Shomnath, Otonu, Omlan, and other uh, faculty members and students, uh, it is a great honor for me to welcome Otonu once again to our institute for delivering students. Hmm? I personally feel very proud when I hear about uh, good achievements of my students. Although I joined the institute in 2005 and Otonu uh, did BTEC in the year 2003, but even then I consider Otunu as my student. And uh, after hearing about uh, his achievement, about his biodata, I feel proud. In fact, uh, uh, he has both academics as well as uh, industry and uh, overall he has been uh, always for the purpose of some uh, activity of his own. This, this is what I am saying to all the students of VPP IMT from the very first day, that uh, it is not only uh, you have to learn, but you have to apply and you try to be an entrepreneur. And I find all these things. and. I am sure all the students, those who are listening today, they will get tremendously benefited by his talk. He is uh, going to give a lecture for some time and then he will interact with the students. And the topic which on which he is going to speak is very much relevant for the present day as well as it will be relevant for quite some time. I think I should not be uh, uh, between you and Otonu for more time and I, with your permission, I will request Otonu to uh, start the program in his own way, that means his presentation as well as his interaction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Somna, Anunna, and others. Thank you, sir. Always a pleasure to be back in uh, uh, college. Uh, so, a couple of things I wanted to uh, establish at the very beginning. Uh, firstly, uh, 
you know, please feel free to write in your questions uh, as uh, you know uh, in the chat window. I will try to answer as many of those questions as possible. Uh, I have seen that a lot of times uh, people don't uh, you know uh, the the questions don't come uh, in the you know people are not very vocal about it. But uh, you know if it helps to write or whatever questions come to your comes to your mind, please feel free to. Uh, you know, uh, put them up in the uh, chat section, and we'll get to them towards the end of the uh, discussion. Uh, today's discussion, I wanted to. Uh, uh, there are two purposes to it. One is definitely an introduction to to machine learning, and I come from a, the second thing is uh, you know, yeah, definitely I wanted to talk about uh, machine learning and its um, applicability today. Uh, and I come from a, a, a domain of uh, Internet of Things, and uh, therefore I'm going to be talking about how machine learning is being used in the Internet of uh, Things. Right. So uh, the purpose is to give you a, an understanding of where the area is headed, what is the kind of work that is uh, going on. And uh, secondly, uh, to also make you aware of the opportunities, the uh, career opportunities that are available in this domain. So, so those are the two purposes with which I wanted to start my uh, discussion. Internet of Things, something that a lot of us have been hearing about. So I'll, I'll start with a brief introduction of where this comes from. In the late 80s, uh, many of you were still in a different stage. So uh, the world was uh, you know, still in its uh, mainframe era. Uh, you had one mainframe, and uh, many people used to timeshare on those uh, mainframes. You, you, you signed up a timeshare sheet, and uh, you, know, you waited till you got your turn. Uh, that was before the you know, 70s, 80s, until the PC started to become mainstream. The important aspect of that is you had one person whose details or you know, was, con was kind of contained within one computer. Uh, a few years later, 10, 15 years later, you had, you know, by the mid 90s, laptops were becoming more and more popular. And with laptops, what meant was you could move with your data. A lot of corporate people were traveling around, you know, they had the their sales data, they had their corporate presentations, all of their data was available with them as they were moving around. And laptops started becoming more and more commonplace. By 2000s, the cell phone market had evolved. The 2G, 2.5G cell phones had come into the market, which meant uh, not only could you call up somebody uh, who was uh, mobile, you could also send them MMS. You could also send them content over the internet to some extent. And that started to evolve as we have gone to uh, 3G, 4G, and now we are talking about 5G uh, implementations, which means 6G is also starting to get, to, to get uh, discussed. But by the late 2000s, Nokia was the boss, and uh, you, know, you had a lot of these smartphones that were coming into the market. Uh, which by 2005, uh, the smartphones were starting to take being take over by the social media platforms. People were logging on to the internet because of their social media platforms, because of their social media presence. You wanted to see what the world was, you know, what your friends were doing around you, what the world was doing around you. And social media was starting to drive a lot of this internet access. Uh, the, the boundaries between online and offline were blurring quite a bit. And uh, uh, laptop sales had uh, uh, surpassed uh, uh, desktop sales, and f uh, cell phones uh, sales, smartphone sales were also on the rise by this time. The boundary between, you know, before 2005, there was a very distinct stage of logging on to the internet where uh, uh, you would, you know, uh, uh, have a dial up connection, you would, you, you would switch on your modem, uh, have those beeping sounds going on, those dial up sounds going on, and there was a very distinct phase of how you logged on. But by 2005, that was going away. You were connected, you were always connected. By 2010, the whole mobile screen was being used for uh, 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 internet access, for e-commerce, for a lot of uh, um, apps that were coming into the market. And these apps, by uh, 2015, they had they had started to power up what was what is known as the gig economy. Today, the number of formal jobs. Uh, are there? There are still going to be, you know, uh, uh, software development jobs and all of that. But more and more jobs are going to be 
part of this gig economy uh, not only will you get your uh, uber uh, services that are been driven by a gig also the you know programmers will be on hire content creators will be for, you know for hire this kind of model will start to take over by the time all of you graduate so that is very important and uh, pertinent to the current set of uh, graduating students a lot of these startups are literally starting out from garages today it does not take the kind of uh, capital investment to uh, uh, to to create a large enterprise facebook started out of a college dorm youtube started out from a college dorm uh, uber came out of a garage uh, 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 netflix um, amazon flipkart you name it all of these companies are garage startups so today you have this billion dollar multi billion dollar companies that essentially started off with literally zero because they were able to amplify their reach to a large number of people and this is happening because we are more and more comfortable about being online not only that we are not only you know that apart from the comfort feeling we have been building up something called a digital stack uh, in india itself today there are uh, several components to this there is the aadhar card which which gives you a guarantee of uh, an individual uh, and their physical presence so the e kyc uh, uh, and the digital identity aspects of it there is uh, upi uh, the unified payment interface stack which allows for a large number of digital Uh, cashless transactions to happen is very scalable system there is the gst uh, which is the uh, the taxation system uh, to to ensure that the transactions are valid and they are uh, recorded properly uh, then we have our own uh, blockchain system that is that is coming up uh, the, the cryptocurrency system that india has been developing so it the 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 cryptocurrency is not part of our taxation system that's the short answer uh we cannot understand where the uh, the transactions are happening and who is uh, are doing them because it is autonomous india in fact has been talking about creating its own bharat currency by the way uh but the underlying platform of blockchain is something that is being uh, promoted by niti aayog uh, there is already uh, eight or 10 major implementations in india uh, including uh, uh, fertilizer subsidy for uh, uh, for you know students certification uh, or college certificate validation for uh, uh, vaccination programs for drug fraudulency so there's already a lot of uh, implementations by the government of india in crypt in blockchain cryptocurrency is a different aspect you can discuss that offline Uh, but with cashless system the, with the india st technology stack that is coming up along with mechanisms like atmanirbhar bharat and uh, uh, the companies that are going to come up over the next 5 or 7 years which are going to leverage this stack for example today you already have a large number of companies which are providing aadhar based services uh, pos validation uh, uh, you know point of sale uh, equipment um, if, if you go to a small uh, pawn shop you'll find the ptm has its uh, uh, payment and uh, smart speaker integrated right so you will find these kind of innovative innovative applications coming into the market more and more so what is happening is that there is been an exponential increase in the number of digital interactions especially with iot based systems where there are a lot of machines a lot of devices which are embedded into our surroundings and which are uh, creating uh, data that can be used more and more people are using this data and there is a larger amount of usage the transactions per capita is also increasing therefore there is an exponential increase in this number of digital transactions and the moment there is an exponential increase in this transactions the traditional systems of uh, processing them traditional database based systems uh, or rdbms based systems are no longer sufficient you are looking at new kind of data storage technologies you are looking at new kind of technologies that can give you real time uh, answers to certain questions right that's where machine learning is starting to come into the picture uh and uh, one more thing is uh, you know it is cricket season so there's a lot of uh, uh, cricket that is also going on and uh, i also wanted to talk about uh, iot and it's uh, you know what's going on in uh, cricket right. uh, we have a game uh, happening tomorrow i hope all of you enjoy it quite a few products coming into the market on the, into into the uh, sports arena let's take a look at one of them
technology is changing the way we see and play the game. Star Speed Striker is a lightweight device that is designed to give you real time back speed, power factor, swing angles, short efficiency, and many other important aspects will improve the padding. Turn your back into a smart pad. Capture every shot on a smartphone with Star Speed. Just play your game and then review at your own convenience. Because with Star Speed Striker, you can now monitor session through videos and TV simulations. So, uh, IoT is becoming very, very mainstream, and it is something that is taking up, you know, that is coming up in every domain. Uh, to summarize what we saw in the last video, uh, you had these sensory systems, which were uh, essentially accelerometric uh, uh, devices, uh, inertial devices, which were capturing uh, uh, accelerometric data, gyroscopic data, uh, and kind of mapping them back. It had a communication system, so it was either using the, the phone as a as a gateway. This particular device uses Bluetooth as its communication uh, mechanism. And uh, from there on, it either communicates to a backend system using a, 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 a 4G a cellular IP, or uh, it connects over uh, Wi-Fi-based uh, systems. There is this very strong uh, user interface, uh, which has a lot of key insights, which has a lot of uh, representations of, uh, uh, of the data, bringing out those aspects which are important for, uh, uh, for the gameplay. So, and uh, uh, finally, you know, if you wanted to go back and, you know, if any individual or any subscriber wanted to go back and then you had this cloud system, which was there in the back end, which was storing all this data and uh, 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 providing uh, a backup uh, system. What is invisible in this infrastructure is an enterprise system which is used to manage the registra registrations if a user you know forgets their logins uh, you can you can manage those uh, users you can uh, 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 make policy decisions you can uh, uh, do firmware updates uh, so those are things that are managed from another backend system an enterprise system uh, so this is a typical workflow in an iot uh, infrastructure and as you can see there are sensory elements there are communication elements there are ui elements there are storage and cloud elements and there are still it systems or enterprise management systems that form part of this iot infrastructure so if i break it down the reason that this infrastructure exists is because it's trying to improve somebody's game or it is trying to answer certain questions. If something happens, then we should do something. So IoT systems to a large extent are something called if systems or if this, then that uh, systems. Uh, this whole paradigm or this whole uh, uh, way of computing is called a recipe. And uh, there are two key aspects to this. One is the this part of it, which is the trigger. Uh, and then there is an action part of it. What happens when you get that trigger? So when you build an IoT system, uh, you line up these uh, recipes one after another. There are different ways of doing that. It could be a fall through system, which is, you know, if case A happens, then do this. If case B happens, then do this. If case A does not happen, then do this. So it could be a linear set of uh, rules uh, and it could process each rule one at a time, or there could be uh, um, a rule that gets evaluated only when something else happens. So it could have uh, the that part of it could be nested. There could be more if then uh, if rules that are there in, in place over there. Uh, you could have a temporal aspect to this. So if this happens within a certain time interval, or if this happens after uh, the first incident, and you know within five minutes of the of the first incident, then do that so this kind of temporal logic can also be incorporated uh, this is called complex event processing uh, so there are multiple ways these multiple architectures that are available for this rule engines but to keep things simple we will call them as if uh, systems so the way i'll break this up is i will look at some of these actions first and then we will go back into what causes this trigger so we'll do a little uh, uh, we'll do this a little backwards they go into this action blocks. Action blocks are nothing new. These have been around for quite a while. Even in uh, traditional uh, IT systems, we have had action, action blocks and various traditional actions. You may be familiar with quite a few of them. For example, uh, you know, when you uh, 
when you book an uh, when you make an a, a, a transaction and uh, a financial transaction you may get an sms from your bank or you may get a push notification that your cab ride has arrived or you may get an email or uh, uh, you may get a, a call you know you know take, telling you your, your otp something like that today most it systems they don't build these uh, uh, actions themselves they take they they take advantage of packaged saas services for example amazon provides something called a simple notification service it's a web service that they provide uh, and uh, you can use it to send push notifications emails uh, it's kind of pre built into the service itself so it accelerates you know services like this they accelerate the development of applications uh, in the market similarly there are other applications where you update a dashboard uh, um, or you you make an update to a to a database so uh, with a dashboard update you may persist the information or you may choose not to persist the information or you may choose to create a report which is a physical form in the form of a pdf and uh, that's kind of uh, you know uh, uh, whereas an, a database record or an, or a dashboard can be changed later on once you create a report it kind of persists unless it is overwritten so if somebody takes a print out of a of a report it stays with them it you cannot change it back but more and more what is happening with iot systems is we are looking beyond these traditional actions we are looking at a lot of signals for example in cricket like uh, you have seen this uh, signaling system where uh, if the if the wickets are disturbed then the and the bales uh, are no longer in contact with the wicket they will light up this is a typical signaling action and uh, this is a pure machine to machine action there is no human involved in the loop uh, there is a signal that is generated uh, because of the contact being broken and that is uh, triggering of the electron so you will find very similar systems Systems that are there in for for traffic lights, for uh, railway uh, uh, signaling systems, for industrial automation. All of them use this kind of signaling actions. Secondly, some of these actions could be forecasting actions, where uh, you know you 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 have, you have uh, seen this DRS system in in cricket, where uh, you have multiple cameras that are tracking the ball to a certain point, and uh, if there is a call that is made. Uh, um, where uh, the umpire feels uh, that the ball has you know will go on to to hit the stump you can actually go to the drs system which will create this prediction so the action here is some kind of a forecasting action given the current location of the ball given its current location and its previous trajectories as computed by its location from multiple cameras how do i predict what its next set of uh trajectories uh, could be and which is the most likely set of uh, trajectories that's the system that we use in uh, drs so this is a forecasting action forecasting is not necessarily related with cricket it has usage in uh, uh, in in uh, 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 you know when you, uh, in, uh, in geolocation systems your estimated time of arrival uh, it has uh, usage in uh, weather systems it has usage in uh, stock markets so there are multiple areas where this kind of forecasting action is used thirdly i'll give you another example of uh, uh, a system which was recently launched by the hokai company uh, uh and what it can do is a, it's a uh, enumeration system and uh, uh, what it happens is it's an image processing system it uh, gives the fans a colored um, uh, artifact in this case a bat uh, an inflatable bat with a, a red, how many greens and how many reds are there and it can count them so it's a dynamic system it's an image processing system and the action here is to count right so that's that's another type of action that you can see uh there are recommendation systems all of you must be using some form of uh, uh some form of streaming platform today most of the streaming platforms are able to you know based on your previous set of uh choices it is able to assign a score uh it is able to assign a score to the uh, remaining set now this can be an exhaustive ranking uh where all other elements for in this in the case of netflix for example it has a you know a large repository of media that is available and not all media will be browsed by you uh, so it looks at your preferences and it ranks the other medias based on your um, uh, based on your preferences and shows you the top 
10, 15, 20 uh, genre-wise breakdown of uh, what things that you may like. This is a recommendation system. A lot of actions are, are based on recommendations uh, where, uh, uh, you know, uh, especially in, in the machine-to-machine -machine context, the example is, uh, uh, you know, when you have a multi-parameter uh, system where especially in, in a shop floor or in, a, in, a, in an industrial setting where there are, you know, hundreds of different uh, controls to take care of. Uh, and uh, you want to understand that given that your steam is at a particular temperature, given that your pressure is at a particular uh, level, what valve conditions should you uh, should be best uh, given the outside heat conditions given the environmental conditions given the prediction about future weather conditions so this is where recommendation systems are used in the iot context uh, machine learning is used because it is not always possible in that case you have to have some probabilistic ranking you can rank only the top few um, and that is where you, you need to get some kind of a trending data, right? For example, if I were to ask you a question about, you know, what are the top 10, uh, what are the top 10 uh, uh, searches that are going on in Google right now? It's not a very simple question to answer. It's a streaming algorithm that you have to develop and it has to be a probabilistic calculation, right? So a lot of actions are based on recommendations. So if something happens, then recommend me what are the next steps. Or if something happens, list or uh, uh, count the number of things that are happening. I'll give you another example where the action, where the action is something which augments our daily belief. It, it kind of brings in an augmented reality. Yeah. So this is an example how how you start to use the data from uh, uh, from IoT based systems to start creating very useful models that are that are useful in real life that are uh, helping us uh, predict uh, potential uh, uh, failures or potential muscle injuries for uh, fast bowlers. Uh, so. Because these are models, what happens is there is, you know, we are, we are talking about machine learning. So there's always this ability to adapt to new information and to change your worldview accordingly. If you get some new information you, and you have a view or a mathematical model, uh, you can update the parameters, the coefficients of that model and uh, uh, create a new worldview. Right. You'll see that in uh, in cricket, when you see uh, the predictability of a win, you see new actions that are coming in and the uh, chances of winning between the two parties, between the two teams, uh, changing and shifting as the match progresses. So that is some actions are with respect to being able to update this kind of a model. Right. Now I'll move a little bit away from the, from the actions into what is the trigger block itself. Right. So first thing I wanted to talk, and if, since we're talking cricket, uh, I wanted to kind of demystify this this sensor abstraction because we use the word sensor very uh, very loosely. Uh, a transducer is not a sensor, is not a detector. These are three different terms and have very different usages. A transducer typically changes one energy form into another. A sensor will sense a physical parameter and give you a voltage output. Uh, whereas a detector will uh, work on that voltage, use some algorithm on top of that and give you a binary a result. For example, uh, uh, 
you know you can have a thermometer a thermometer is a sensor but if the thermometer tells you if somebody has fever or not that's a fever detector so that's the difference really so even in cricket we see a large number of sensors that are being used for example the microphone is used in a system called the snico which uh, detects if the if the ball uh, connect you know if the ball passed by or touched the bat and the detector model is just absolute it just passes on the absolute noise pressure uh, and uh, for for visual inspection and it's a human who actually looks at it and says you know if if uh, the uh, uh, ball touched the bat um, or not Uh, however you have uh, something called hotspot where hotspot uses an ir camera and it it has a detection model where uh, you uh, look at the heat that is generated as the as the, as the frictional heat that the ball generates when it rubs onto something uh, it subtra- subtracts that uh, 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 frictional heat from previous images and identifies if there is an area where that friction was generated so the detector is part of the detection algorithm is part of the detector itself of the ir camera itself or it could be you know in in a software system but the hotspot system the hotspot detector essentially tells you if there or and marks out where there was a nick uh, uh, on the on the bat no ball detection again something that we use by look, looking just at the camera image itself uh, we place the image and it's usually the third umpire who looks at it and says if you know uh, uh, if somebody overstepped or not it is purely human experience that uh, uh, makes that decision the smart voting system that i sh- that i uh, uh, showcased a couple of slides ago is where pattern recognition is coming in the detection model is essentially looking for uh, those artifacts and remember those artifacts can change across games in cricket it could be look it could look like a wicket in uh, tennis it could look like a tennis bat right so it, there could be different patterns that we are looking for in different games and different situations uh, or it could be uh, uh, used for traffic pattern detection um and counting the types of cars that are moving on a particular motorway so the detection pattern can change but the idea here is the detector the detection model is part of the camera itself and uh, it gives you uh, you know instead of giving you that image it actually gives you that number out this detector is also helpful because instead of transmitting uh, a camera a, a video from the from the camera to the to the back end system all it needs to transfer is just a uh, number you will find these kind of systems been also used for uh, uh, you know in the retail industry um, a lot of shops use this kind of technology to count the number of people who are coming into the shop where they are moving around how many people went to the dairy section versus how many people went to the uh, clothing section so these kind of things video is an extension of the camera system because you have multiple images so an an event happens not in one image but it is happening over multiple images so you have to look at how uh, an object of interest is is uh, uh, changing over multiple frames in order to uh, uh, identify a pattern so there is spatial positioning that comes in a typical example is ball tracking systems uh, that are that are used in cricket uh the bail lights that you saw they were primarily proximity sensors and is threshold bail threshold based uh, same kind of sensors you will find on your uh, phone because if you put the phone near your ear it will detect that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that it is close by uh, the uh, uh, proximity sensor will come below a particular threshold and you can turn off the screen lights uh, or in case of cricket uh, you can switch on the bail lights uh ball speed is measured using a radar um, uh, very much like a so, you know sonar model where you use the uh, uh, the reflected the reflected value to calculate the speed of the ball right so sensors are i what is the point i wanted to make that sensors are different from detectors because there is a model that is in place there is some computation that is happening along with the sensory image uh, in order to detect right and sensory data can be of various types especially in case of of machine data this this data can be of several types it could be this analog data that you are getting um, a lot of sensors will give you uh, an absolute value value that you quantify that you quantize and uh, uh, get binary you know digital data out of it 
or it could be on and off data. Um, a lot of industrial machines, they uh, whether it is on or off, and the duration, the duration is the more important data point. So you need to know when the data, when the device is coming on or when the device is going off. Or you have uh, absolute digital values, whether the temperature reading at a given point was uh, was 1101 or 1301 or uh, 11001, uh, whatever the, the digital value, uh, that's your digital data. In a lot of cases, it's it's a stream of digital data. It's not one stream. It is not individual data pieces that come through, but you have a continuous measurement that is happening and a continuous stream of serialized data that comes in. And you have to be able to process that uh, to, to understand uh, uh, how your system is behaving. In other cases, you will get structured data. Structured data is usually provided by detectors, which sensors which have an embedded computing system. They will capture the value. They will structure it into a JSON or an XML or uh, some kind of a rich text format, human readable format, and then transmit it over uh, a communication interface. When you get structured text, it is easier to understand uh, this kind of uh, uh, data. If you look at it, there'll be more meaning to this data, but you have to understand that it takes up a lot more space and a lot more communication bandwidth. So there is always a trade-off in the, in, the, in the type of data that you get and the uh, 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 usefulness of the human readability of that data. Then you have image data, which is essentially uh, uh, raw CMOS, uh, you know, the data that you get from the CMOS sensor itself. And uh, current generation systems are able to uh, work on the uh, camera uh, CMOS sensor itself. It is able to be co-located with the camera. And then what it can do is it can uh, do this image processing algorithms and uh, you know, kind of create these bounding boxes and identify what kind of device, what kind of patterns are we really talking about? So image is a very common form of data that you see uh, from coming in from, from machines, whether it is uh, for security purposes, whether it is for counting purposes, whether uh, it is for uh, detection purposes. So in material of that, you get a lot of machine data, which is in the form of images. A lot of smart speakers have come into the market, which means that uh, not only have do we have to deal with sound data or noise data, which is in the form of um, analog data, but in a lot of cases, we have to extract the uh, the meaning from uh, the human meaning or the context from the speech content of that data. So that is where uh, you see smart speaker systems which uh, look at uh, uh, you know uh, conversational platforms uh, where uh, you take the, uh, uh, the the image the the uh, sound waves directly and you try to extract what was said, what was the text equivalent of that. And finally, when you have a large number of um, images coming together, that is where you have to look at your, your uh, object of interest and track it across multiple frames. And that's essentially what video and gesture recognition is all about. So a lot of times we'll get video data. Now, the new, the latest thing in the market is where, you know, a system like uh, ball tracking or uh, DRS, where you not only have video, but you have multiple video streams that you have to track across. So your machine data can be as simple as uh, a quantized analog data to as complex as uh, multiple streams of video that you have to fuse to get some meaning out of it. Because of this, you, you know, the reason you are using, you have to understand why you are using machine learning here. And that's because, you know, it has to serve a purpose. Either that purpose is with respect to, uh, you know, reducing the bandwidth that you need to communicate or uh, the, the need to, um, uh, you know, recognize these patterns and count the number of uh, things that you see in your field of view. Or it is to, to kind of do some deep learning in order to be able to classify something, you know, very useful for optical character recognition, for speech, for natural language processing, for speech recognition systems like that. Uh, you look at deep learning for, in order to classify a lot of uh, ambiguous situations. Uh, you, 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 are, you are looking at machine learning in order to create better and faster scoring systems. Uh, you look at uh, uh, machine learning for uh, prediction algorithms for, for, for forecasting, and you look at machine learning in order to give you that data to 
create rich uh, visualizations that can give you some kind of an intuitive insight. So uh, in summary, IoT systems use machine learning algorithms uh, extensively for uh, compression, for classification, for enumeration, for recommendation, for prediction, and for visualization of machine data. Right. So what kind of questions can be answered using ma machine learning? Well, first of all, you can answer these membership questions. Right. So if something is in or out, uh, something is part of a group, something looks very similar to a group or not. Uh, it can be used for classification of which type. If you have already have a set of uh, known clusters, then a machine learning can help classify some of these, uh, 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 some of the newer, uh, you know, some of the newer data sets that are coming in. You train your model on, uh, you train your model on some training data and then you show it new kinds of data and ask it to classify. Uh, that's where uh, uh, good machine learning systems will come in. Sometimes the classifications are not known in advance, and that is where you need to create the classification methodology. So you have to answer that question of how many types. Uh, you know, if, if in case of bowling, is it just that somebody is bowling on a you know on a full length, good length, or short length, or you know, is there a different set of classifications? Or if a particular bowler does not bowl in any one of these uh, predefined clusters, they have they are forming a new cluster of their own. So that's the clustering question that can be answered. And uh, finally, to be able to count how many have happened, this is uh, not, as I mentioned, this is not only used in, uh, uh, in, in gaming systems and uh, 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 sports, but extensively used in, uh, uh, in the industrial production where you are, uh, where you use photography of you know, something as, as trivial as sorting out apples, good apples versus bad apples, good oranges versus bad oranges, counting the number of oranges, looking for defects in a manufactured piece, uh, x-raying them as they are, you know, um, as they are on the assembly line and identifying structural, uh, uh, structural defects before those components become part of a, uh, a larger product, right? So the, those are the kind of questions that we can answer with machine machine learning. Uh, in terms of how to compute, there are a large number of models. We are really running a little short on time. So I'm going to rush through a little bit over here. Of course, you can do algebraic computation. Uh, we understand this very well. You solve some algebraic formulas. Your uh, 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 model is represented as a polynomial, and uh, the coefficients determine how how that uh, model is shaped. As you uh, come across new values, you solve that polynomial uh, or, or updates its coefficients to come up with new new values, right? There's a lot of statistical computation that you can do uh, with respect to these, uh, you know, uh, these uh, measures of central tendency. You can look at means, modes, averages, all of that. You can see how the uh, group is uh, uh, behaving or changing with uh, uh, new kind of inputs. You can do various kinds of distance measurements with uh, statistical computation. Right? So th there are a lot of powerful tools that we already have uh, from the statistical world. Signal processing, a lot of computation, it becomes useful because we are able to change. Uh, we are able to change uh, the the signal from one domain to another, from a time domain to a frequency domain, or you know similar uh, uh, changes in their uh, dimensions. Uh, and uh, we have been evolving a lot of signal processing for uh, audio, for uh, radio signal processing. So all of these, uh, you know, identifying which is the best bandwidth for a, a, a cell phone to communicate uh, with. Uh, those are kind of signal processing decisions that we are we are making today. There's a lot of natural language processing. Uh, people who are familiar with Alexa, with uh, uh, Siri, uh, with Cortana, these are all natural language processing systems which are advanced uh, uh, speech extraction systems or text extraction systems from, from speech. Uh, image processing, we've taken a large number of examples in my talk. So image processing, this is also something that is well understood and there are well-defined methods in terms of uh, how do you uh, uh, compress a particular image? How do you identify areas of interest? How do you uh, create, how do you identify transition zones from uh, a point of interest, from an area of interest uh, to outside it? How do you create a bounding box around it? And how do you track that bounding box over time? So uh, these are uh, algorithms that are well 
understood and can be applied uh, in the context of IoT. Uh, neural networks is something uh, which uh, comes in when uh, uh, when we are trying to have better classification and clustering algorithms. Uh, how the neural network is assigning weights to its uh, deeper layers is something that is not very well understood yet and there's a lot of research work that can happen here but uh, how to train a neural network how to train a convolution network or how to train an artificial uh, neural network those are techniques that has developed over the last uh, almost 30 35 years now and um, they have evolved significantly similarly there are other types of uh, uh, computational models that you can look at including genetic algorithms or cellular automata which can help you identify what is the local uh, kind of the local minima in your search space essentially the whole idea or, or why we are going about these algorithms is it is extremely difficult to search through all the potential options uh, uh, given the complexity of our uh, of our uh, systems today uh, the, the number of possible options or the you know uh, the, the number of possible options that are out there if we have to, to do it in a very con very uh, conventional way we will not we do our algorithms are not have not evolved to that level of complexity uh, uh, where they can solve lar for large data sets. What I'm trying to say is that our algorithms are still uh, uh, not order one or uh, constant order algorithms. They are mostly higher order, either log n or uh, 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 n square kind of algorithms that we have today. And those algorithms are, do not work well uh, when we are dealing with a very large data set. Uh, so in order to reduce latency, we have to look at non-deterministic processes. We have to look at systems which uh, are not always explainable, if I will, if you may. Uh, and that's where this neural networks, genetic algorithms and cellular automata kind of come into the picture. Right? Uh, I showed you earlier on where, you know, uh, the entire IoT infrastructure, uh, the, depending on the cost for a particular solution, uh, as an IoT architect, it becomes very important to understand where do I put this computational model. If I am doing machine learning, I need computational resources. I need a compute. I need a, a processor to be able to do it. I need memory to be able to do it, and that will always incur a cost. So there is always an option of where do I put in this cost so that I create a solution that is cost effective whether i should do that pattern recognition in the directly in the sensor itself and increase the cost of the sensor from five dollars to fifty dollars or i should uh, uh, have a five dollars camera uh, uh, pay you know ten dollars a month for uh, uh, sending that data to a central server do the processing there those are business decisions uh, uh, as well as, but from a from a technology perspective, as a, as a solution architect, those are places where people, you know, there's a lot of skilled workforce that is in demand, who have to determine where exactly that computation model has to fit in, whether it has to go into the sensor itself, or it has to go into the networking elements, or it has to go into the the edge gateways, uh, which are the on-site gateways, uh, 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 on-premise gateways in the in, in, in industrial setups or it has to go up to the cloud system, or we leverage the computational power that is available in the user interface, like in the mobile app to do this computation. So different models, different models will have different levels of complexity and based on which they can be installed or they are best deployed in different areas, in different computational platforms. A lot of times what happens is the computation, creating the model, you process the entire data set and you create that model in a cloud computing infrastructure where it is cheaper to do that computation. Once the model has come out, once you have a polynomial with a set, you know, once you've identified the coefficients that are that are uh, uh, that define the model you are looking for, you can transfer those coefficients onto the sensor. So that is one way of running the model in a different location versus developing the model. Right. So, where you compute the model is part of your machine learning uh, setup. Uh, I had a pop quiz. I had a question in terms of uh, if you are building this kind of machine learning platforms, what kind of design patterns can you use for scalability and maintainability? I'm not going to go into this today, but uh, think about it. It's a design question. It, if you are building a scalable solution, if you are building a commercial grade solution, you have to think about these two aspects. You have to think about 
how it will scale as your system go, grows to hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands and millions and tens of millions of users and how do you maintain that code base uh, uh, tomorrow if you have to you know you 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 deploy something and you have to change a bug or you have to do a code fix if you do not have control over that code base it becomes extremely difficult right so this is where you may have to think about how do you create decoupled architectures how do you create a uh, 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 scalable you know uh, uh, rule engines uh, how do you create a brokering system how do you use thread pools or you know native web services load balancing services so these are all aspects of enterprise architecture uh, that uh, you can all think about it's it's something that is going to be very important in your careers uh, Finally, I wanted to get into the segment of talking about IoT and its future readiness because IoT, the way I see it, is a is a is a technology gateway. IoT talks about how do you bring together the uh, uh, the embedded systems, the communication systems, and today IoT had another word to it, which is called AIoT or AI in IoT, machine learning in AIoT. In, in IoT. IoT systems are not going to be valid unless we have advanced machine learning models and AI running on the devices, on the network, on the uh, 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 computing infrastructure. So the reason I say IoT is a technology gateway is because irrespective of, of whether your interest is in terms of creating advanced mobile apps or creating advanced uis uh, or you want to create the back end the solid back end enterprise web applications or uh, web systems enterprise it systems iot needs those iot systems need those kind of applications iot systems need advanced ai and ml uh, systems iot needs a lot of cloud integration a lot of uh, uh, you know being able to leverage a lot of services that are already pre built because you don't want to develop a system over years and years you want to leverage what is out there and build the business case in the in your minimum viable business case in the quickest amount of time probably in terms of days and weeks not in terms of months and years of course embedded engineering is something you know people who are coming in from electronics communications background embedded engineering is very very essential to uh, 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 to iot based systems and the latest thing that is coming up is around blockchain uh, we may do another session around this uh, at a later point uh, but having this irrefutable non fungible uh, source of truth uh i if you cannot you know if the iot systems cannot uh, if, if they cannot trust where the data is getting stored then this kind of data will start getting stored on blockchain systems where contracts will start getting stored on blockchain systems and iot systems they will uh, uh, they will interact and they will provide services and record those transactions on these distributed databases uh, as you develop your career i think it is important for all of you to understand that uh, you have to understand where your technology fitment is what is it that you enjoy doing and what is it that you like doing uh, whether you are interested towards mobile app development if that is something that you are passionate about my recommendation is go after it if if you if you think that you know cloud systems or or, or algorithm development is where your focus is and that is something that you are passionate about and you can stay up nights developing them go for ml development go for AI AI development. So identify which are those areas. These are these are reflective questions. Identify those areas which make you feel comfortable, uh, and build your projects. Do your projects that will exemplify and bring out those those characteristics to your potential uh, recruiter. If I talk about IoT in terms of what is the future for an IoT engineer, IT has been around in our country for almost thirty years now, and it has. It, it has grown to about six hundred billion dollars. Right. It is still going to grow in the next five to six years. It is still going to grow at an average of six to eight uh, percent at a compounded rate. So it is still going to grow to about one point one trillion dollars globally. Right. Uh, and India takes a significant portion of that. But the IoT industry is something that is at two hundred and twelve billion dollars today and is expected to grow to about one point six trillion dollars by twenty twenty five. That is something where the managed services for uh, uh, for IoT is growing at almost a thirty percent uh, compounded growth rate, which means that there are going to be these new opportunities that are going to come into this market. These are going to be new opportunities for field engineering. There's going to be new opportunities for full stack developers as well as end to end solution developers. Right. What you will find is, if you are 
thinking about building a career in iot it is something that is future ready it is a future ready because it gives you a first mover advantage it is still an area which is where new companies are coming in because there are new startups they, these are uh, uh, companies that are thinking about new kind to build new kinds of products to solve local problems uh, there is a you know there is very high visibility within this organizations there is an ability to grow inorganically uh, in these organizations you start off as uh, you may start off as developer but it is very easy to become a chief engineer or to become a solution architect in these companies if you if the product really takes up in the market there is an opportunity to do really disruptive work uh, you know and, and and mostly these kind of companies they offer anywhere between 40 to 60% better salaries as compared to uh, it jobs uh, uh, standard it jobs uh, that are that are available today right uh, for those who who, who do, do not want to get into it 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 gives you the ability to kind of focus on what is it that you want to focus on to kind of work in your core area for people in the top were not coming in from a computer science background were coming in from an electrical background or were coming in from a production background it allows them to kind of stay stick with their uh, uh, focus areas and finally what i want to say is that it does not take away anything from your current mainstream opportunities if you wanted to uh, do a, you know if you wanted to explore iot and uh, uh, do a project which is focused on the web development part of it it will still allow you to go ahead and build a career as a web developer it will still go, allow you to go ahead and build a career as a mobile app developer or as a systems engineer so it does not take away from any of your current mainstream opportunities but having that end to end uh, you know that end to end perspective helps you position yourself better uh, in your careers because remember the number of candidates who are out today there are almost 8 lakh graduates who are coming out from engineering colleges every year so you have to stand out in your resume you have to stand out uh, in how you go to an interview and the kind of companies that you are approaching so that you are already fit for them uh, you, you have to be able to stand out from everybody else so finally uh, if you want to take, go down uh, iot with a career path you have to think of it that uh, you know that itself offers multiple options uh, it offers options around field engineering where there's a lot of testing deployment uh, all of that involved especially with smart cities coming into the picture there are going to be a lot of requirements for field engineers uh, companies like quest they are already getting into it and uh, uh, this is the area that is going to uh, have a large uptake of candidates in the next 3 to 4 years time frame uh many of you may be applying for academic positions you may be you know interested in in higher studies or you may be applying to other universities well uh you in which case you need to kind of have a more research bent and you kind of you can use iot as a mechanism to demonstrate your abilities to solve uh, a research problem right uh, then there are people who are going to be finicky who would want to uh, have multiple things in their solution who would want to experiment with a lot of different things and these are people who are who are generally an organization tends to keep in their r&d teams because they are very good quick with their prototyping they can incorporate a new technology and build a quick prototype around it so if you if you are somebody who enjoys doing that you should have a career path in that prototyping phase right in that building yourself as a prototyper then there are these product developers who will go very deep into a product into a, into a problem statement you will go deeper and deeper and you will start try to evolve your algorithms your solution uh, so that it is faster it is uh, meaner it is less it is more power efficient it is less uh, memory uh, constrained so those are people who are typically very well suited for product companies into the product development life cycle especially with long duration products uh, i used to work for a healthcare company earlier on and our product life cycle when we think about an idea uh, from there on to when that idea actually makes it into a product was a 8 year cycle uh, so sometimes you know you need to think out literally outside the box in order to develop these kind of new feature sets right uh, solution architects are usually people whether it is as an iot solution architect or as a web solution architect or as a cloud solution architect architect roles typically come in when you have done a number of different projects and you can offer a perspective and uh, the you know you can explain to somebody what are the trade offs between various options that you might uh, you might take up 
right? Uh, and finally, in terms of product management, these are these are typically roles where you know those of you who want to uh, come back to a technology role after pursuing and maybe a business uh, administration course, you can look at product management. Uh, product management involves a lot of market research, understanding how the market is working, what are the gaps in the market, defining the kind of new features that must be part of the product. Uh, uh, you know, doing a lot of vendor management. Where are the components and the pieces that are going to be part of your product? Where are they going to come from? Uh, what are the, their budgets going to be? What is the cost of your of your final product? How are you going to market the product? Uh, you know, whether you want uh, Shikhar Dhawan to go and uh, talk about your bat or somebody else, or uh, you know, uh, Rithik Roshan to uh, uh, come and advertise your product. You know, so all the way from sourcing to 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 the marketing aspects of it. These are controlled by the product management team. So. When you think of IoT as a career path, you can also think of where your personal interests are. How do you see your career or which areas do you uh, think are going to be of more interest to you? My recommendation has always been that go talk to your peers, talk to your seniors, understand you know what roles do they do in their organizations how do they go about their day-to-day -day jobs and what you know what what is their uh, uh, how, how does the organization measure their value right that will give you a sense of what is the work expectation in each of these roles and how do you see yourself growing uh, in each of these roles of course none of it is binary which means that any role that you take up will have aspects of uh, all of them if you are thinking beyond IT, there are a very large number of uh, multi-billion dollar organizations that are out there which are looking for IoT engineers, right from the semiconductor companies like NVIDIA, ARM, Samsung, large number of uh, 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 electronic companies who are looking for people to help test out their chipsets, help build their chipsets, help, help uh, uh, you know, build use cases around their chipsets. There are a large number of connectivity providers, including uh, Geo, Tata, Airtel, Sigfox, all of them are moving into the 5G spectrum. They are looking at new IoT communication protocols like LoRa, LoRaWAN, like uh, narrowband IoT, like uh, uh, Sigfox, like uh, Wison. So different connectivity platforms are being offered. And a lot of systems engineers are going to be required by these companies in this space. Uh, the cloud companies, they are offering newer and newer services, uh, SaaS services, uh, which they are looking to integrate and build on. Right. So you have the Amazons, Googles, uh, Azures, all of these companies uh, which are opening up uh, uh, new uh, requirements and uh, they, there will be a lot of openings for coders uh, in this space. Solution companies like Bosch, the Cisco's, the Ericsson's, uh, uh, Siemens of the world, right? Uh, there are multiple companies in this space which are billion dollars. All of these companies that have listed here have a significant presence in India. So if you are building your careers to go into any of these companies, you have to start shaping up for those right now, right? Uh, so that's essentially what I had in my discussion. I, uh, I have. Uh, Otono, I, I'll read out one question which was way uh, back in the chat box, you may not be able to locate. It was, how much and what kind of mathematics is needed to learn ML? In each of these, right? Uh, one of my projects uh, involved creating a mechanism to understand uh, 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 it, it, it was a project around something called electroblasto. It was called blastocardiography, and uh, the project essentially was that you have somebody lying on a bed, and uh, because their heart is beating, it creates a uh, you know uh, Newton's law, so it creates a negative vibration on the bed itself. Now, can you start identifying the accelerometric pattern on the bed and uh, calculate the heart rate, calculate the peak heart rate, uh, calculate any you know uh, essentially an ECG pattern out of it, right? Uh, your cardiac volume if necessary. So the way you are converting from that uh, the the you know um, uh, accelerometric data and identifying the pulses uh, the energy in that waveform uh, to a heartbeat right that was essentially the model that we had to compute right so these are typically computed by uh, you know having some kind of a threshold saying when the threshold crosses uh, a particular value we will 
start listening for the next set of values and uh, then you create a you know one second or a uh, two second kind of a window and you capture the uh, uh, the uh, accelerometer readings in that window uh, then you do a uh, you know, if you're doing an energy computation then you kind of uh, do a square law computation on that to, to kind of get a sense of what is the net energy content in that wavelet uh, in ev every one of those wavelets so those are situations where it is purely algebraic uh, and uh, if you if you can model uh, a heartbeat, you can say that a heartbeat typically must have an energy content uh, more than a, 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 a x value. So if your net summation of all those uh, uh, individual uh, uh, axiometric readings came up more than that, you said heartbeat plus one. In some cases, uh, it is statistical. Especially, I gave you an example of uh, asking these questions of uh, you know top n kind of a question. Uh, what are the top n incidents in a stream of data? That is where you go into purely statistical computation. You look at uh, um, at a window and look at the probability of each of those uh, uh, incidents occurring. And then uh, as you see new and new uh, uh, data coming in, uh, you update those uh, those probabilities and uh, either weigh them up or weigh them down. So similarly, what will happen is if, if, if something is starting to trend better uh, it will drop out from your uh, top end list and something is uh, tr you know trending down if something is trending up it will come up in your top end list uh, so when you do statistical it is purely statistics it is uh, it is it is just a conditional a lot of uh, base theorem a lot of conditional probability uh, uh, that you are that you are working on right uh, you already have certain measures of uh, uh, spread a certain measures of variance and uh, 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 peak mesh amplitude measurements that you kind of bring into the equation. Signal processing is a different area altogether. Signal processing and image processing, there you are looking at uh, uh, um, a lot of matrix manipulation. Uh, if you are trying to get data from a CMOS sensor, which has a particular organization, there's an address for every sensor, that every pixel that you have there, you extract that value out and then you are trying to create a pattern uh, from you know what you see in a visual region is not necessarily continuous in a sensor space in the pixel space so you have to kind of be able to isolate that and that is where you do a lot of matrix manipulation a lot of matrix masking uh, in order to identify those uh, uh, regions so a lot of tools are there at our disposal at, at our disposal puzzle you have to start looking at the problem um, to identify the set of solutions you need to go after or the kind of mathematical tools that you need to go after but probabilities should be strong uh, you know, uh, matrix, uh, if you're doing image processing, matrix manipulation should be strong. If you are doing uh, signal processing, then uh, being able to move um, uh, between domains. So fast Fourier, you know, a lot of these Fourier transformations, a lot of these uh, uh, Laplacians, uh, those will, you know, uh, those will come into, uh, into, into play. A lot of differential, partial differential equations will come into play there. Thanks so much. I think the question whoever has asked, it is answered. It's a great presentation. Othono, Jadip is still around. Jadip is around, so I, I would also, uh, you know, ask him to join in as well. Uh, uh, the second thing is, yeah, I think, I think, as a, as a computer engineer, I think, I think, engineering, you know, itself is something which is very. Uh, very dirty, let me put it this way. Engineers are people who used to go in engines who would actually put coal and make sure that all the valves were working. You had to uh, uh, make sure that the pressures were going on and the actual engine was turning the wheels. That was an engineer. And it meant that you had suit all over you, you had ink all over you. Engineering is by default a dirty job, which means that you have to get dirty. Uh, whether it is getting your hands on with code, uh, you have to understand what, why you are coding something. And the code is just like a mean, it's just a means to an end. It is not the sole purpose. If I don't know if any of you have ever seen a legal document, uh, the way a, a, a legal draft is, is, is uh, made up, you will find that it resembles code. It will say that the plaintiff or so-and-so hereafter called the plaintiff, so-and-so hereafter called the defender. 
the name of company here after call the company so this, and then you have you know your your clauses and everything which are just declarative which is just like declaring you know what are the variables that you want uh, what are you know how do you want them to move around uh, and and how are you are going to use the logic to connect all of them together right so you have to get into coding you have to understand what code does you cannot be afraid of it right having said that it is not necessarily that all of you will end up doing a job doing a coding job doing a job where you know day to day uh, you you are coding i haven't coded in the last 20 years right which does not mean that today if i have to sit down and and write a piece of code i can absolutely give me any language i can write a piece of code in that be it in python be it on ruby be it on uh, 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 you know javascript it does not matter because we are coming from a fundamental perspective fundamental point of what do i want to achieve if i am clear on that then it is you are able to look up examples on the internet you are able to look up tutorials on the internet and you will be able to see you know this particular language this this you know de defines its variables in this particular syntax this particular language defines its variables in this particular syntax these are the basic data types so the fundamentals have to be strong right so fundamentals you need to know what your variables are what is happening when you move things around right the more if you are more interested in coding then what you do is you start learning a lot of these design patterns and the more patterns you understand you know you understand the singleton pattern then you when you are having a conversation with another engineer the discussion is always going to be technical you are not going to go and have a uh, uh, have a uh, descriptive dis discussion uh, uh, when you get a job assigned from a, you know in your work group or anything you are going to be told that i need you to build something which is going to have this interface this interface must provide me certain apis or certain calls and when i call that api the return should be in this particular format so the interfaces start to get defined you can write your code any which way you want as long as those interfaces are consistent and you are not uh you are not executing uh cases or you are not executing logic which is contrary to your business requirement that is the essence of it another point that i you know if you are taking a lot of you know if you are looking at uh, uh, systems like sketch today there are a lot of visual ids that are available today uh, which allow you to uh, not get into the nitty gritties of of code patterns but these are all drag and drop patterns right uh, and uh, they they are going to be there but unless you fundamentally understand what that piece of logic is doing i think uh, it's going to be a shot in the dark so the coding fundamentals is going to be important but it means that you have to look up those resources there are plenty of resources on the internet i do not want any of you to go and join another coding class right that does not solve it it is your passion about coding that has to drive it and if you find that coding is not your cup of tea you you enjoy the coding you understand what uh, uh, the code is working you can read code but you want to explore other aspects of a business uh, um, uh, of a career then those options are are very much available today if you are looking at uh, uh, you know uh, for example digital media right understanding uh, 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 how how digital marketing happens you have to understand pretty complex algorithms to be able to use that effectively to be able to understand what kind of algorithms can i use to pick a search term that i want to buy for an organization now those marketing metrics what are the footprints what are the click rates what are the click -through? so those are concepts that you need to understand if you do not want to get into coding and you want to explore a career in digital marketing uh, similarly if you wanted to get explore a market in uh, something as diverse as uh, say cinematography or uh, 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 you know film production even that is digitized today you have to understand what those softwares are doing today in order to leverage or be effective in your uh, skills right uh, most software like whether it is photo editing whether it is uh, 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 audio editing uh, um, youtube creation even those softwares are uh, pretty self explanatory but you have to build up that skill set i hope that that uh, reflects on your question sir right yeah thank you so much i am here in personal capacity and uh, kind of uh, because i had known atanu from my college days and um, Uh, yeah we have discussed these things uh, uh, i i have actually 3 minutes with me before i get into another call actually 
so um, uh, first of all it's nice to see so many of you and it's quite nostalgic in a way that uh, uh, we are doing it with an audience of our own college i had myself been a student of uh, uh, kanjilal ma'am she won't remember me because i had been a black sheep in my college days and continue to be so and uh, not uh, uh, currently also into a hardcore technical line but yes i work with a tech company uh, in a very different kind of uh, capacity and different role uh, regarding uh, i mean just just uh, my two uh, sense before i drop out of this call what uh, uh, azun was saying regarding how you learn coding so i i just remember and i i refer to the kind of discipline from where i come from in today's context uh, we all know biscuits are bad for health right uh, anything that is baked cannot be good for health so i remember a britannia ad when they came up with the first uh, uh, biscuits which had fibers into it uh, they had shown an ad which said that obviously it's a biscuit so it will not be good for health but it has fiber which is making it less unhealthy and the communication to the audience was uh, we have come halfway you also come halfway which means that once both both the parties come halfway then only you meet uh, coding is very similar uh, uh, any machine has a mind of its own so when we teach the machine to do certain things in the same process in a very layman's way we also need to understand how we make them understand what our comments uh, commands are any coding fundamentally is a process of understanding how my extended machine is going to work for me that is the main idea and as a result of that the, the fundamental question is why do we why do we have a different language for coding and why can't we code in english or bengali so for example because that language is not for the kind of computation and communication that we are going to make or a command that go i'm going to write for a machine so in a way what atanu is saying is it's not about c or java or python it's about that orientation and that openness in mind that whatever way i can best communicate with the device that i'm creating to solve a purpose that needs to be learned with your own clarity of thought thanks joy i think you have touched upon within such a short time the crux of the problem actually so thank you thank you ma'am okay ma'am there are various kinds of uh... so rajshikar uh, so python has been around a little longer than r first of all and uh, python uh, the syntax is very very easy to relatively easy to pick up uh, python comes with a lot of its inbuilt uh, libraries because it has been around for a for a long time and the way python has been architected again this is a fundamental question of trying to get a system to learn you know to get to do what you are trying to do so python in the way the the language is it's itself it has been structured uh, is its interpretive in nature uh, secondly its ability to link libraries dynamically has been uh, has been uh, uh, good and it, it's been a fundamental design aspect of it thirdly uh, it's not python that is uh, that is usually compared with r it is usually numpy or scipy that is compared with r right and uh, numpy is a uh, 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 you know when we started using python uh, i think that was version 1. Point something when python was still kind of buggy and still you know uh, people said hey it is something that is already taking care of your lists it is taking care of uh, you know it has uh, when you are creating something like a list it already has this basic uh, uh, it has this basic uh, constructs of uh, 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 beginning end uh, uh, averages you know you, you can compute this really fast the way it was storing its local variables and it was uh, uh, its algorithms to scan the lists and all were, were almost constant order at that point so it it got a lot of adoption it got a lot of adoption from people who are not necessarily coming in with a pure statistical coming you know with a pure statistical weka r kind of a background so python was something where i could write a program i could actually write a deployment script so that my program would actually it would take a piece of code sitting on my computer deploy it on hundreds of different machines get them to start synchronously get the whole data in process that entire chunk uh, keep it in multiple places you know run some machine learning on that get a summary create a pdf out of that summary create a web page and serve that pdf on that web page so python allowed me this entire spectrum of work that i needed to do whereas 
R was significantly limited on that. Having said that, R has these very specialized use cases. When you are dealing with significantly uh, astronomical data, when you are today the programs that have already been built, those have to be those have to be maintained. So when there is a critical mass, newer programs will continue because of business or commercial reasons. Uh, because it is easier to find a developer in Java, so a lot of a lot of questions, webs, a lot of things will be built in Java. I was building my own website. I wanted to build a, a, a website on React. I could not find a good React developer. So I had to go back and find a PHP developer. Doesn't mean that I, I that I prefer PHP. No, I couldn't find somebody who would do a, 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 a React development. Thanks, Atunu. We have to conclude here. Give a big hand and a uh, big a, uh, camera on. Thank you, Atunu, for patiently Thank handling you. this. Yeah, great. Thank you. We in the we will definitely get you after one uh, month. That uh, that uh, blockchain is very interesting topic also. That is also a blockchain. It's a new thing. Thank you very much. Bye.